leaning on the mighty arm of Jesus. That's the answer to winning the war within. The Bible is a manual for spiritual warfare. It tells us the enemy that we engage, the strategies we must use, the armor we are to put on, the attitude, the frame of mind, the focus on Christ that will lead us to victory. But it's also a book about recovery, really from the beginning all the way through. Even great heroes like David and Simon Peter, or those that met Jesus in the Gospels, the Samaritan woman at the well, the penitent thief, the woman caught in adultery. And then the letters are written so that as we fall, we need not let that be permanent, but by turning back to Christ, by accessing the resources that he's provided, then we can again regain our composure. Failure is not final because every time we fall, we get up again. This is the last in the series, Winning the War Within. This post and all the others will be available on the church website if there's one that you missed or would like to watch or go to again. You know what your temptations are, your defeating habits, your struggles, the setbacks, the weights that you carry, the things that beset you. And you feel, as I do from time to time, that you try and try and try, you go and you strive and you make that effort and then you stumble. What do you do now? We'll always struggle with the battle and sin as long as we're in the world in which we live. That's why I love that song that Scott led, Walking Alone at Eve, because it dreams of a time in heaven's grace where we'll see him face to face and we'll no longer have the burdens or the challenges or the obstacles that we face in this life. If you'd open your Bible to John chapter 21, we're going to look at how Jesus reinstated Jesus, uh, Peter after his three denials by repeating the miraculous catch of fish that we noted in Luke 5, and then by cooking breakfast, fish on a charcoal fire. The same kind of fire where Simon had denied his Lord three times, not too much earlier. And in these questions, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Jesus shows Peter that there's a way back, and it's based on love and his decision to walk with Jesus, to leave the past behind, to start fresh, and then he'll become this bold, confident apostle who will speak with the others on the day of Pentecost and be God's servant to so many. As we begin today, I wonder if you know the date, June 6th in history, 1944. We just had its anniversary. What happened way back when? D-Day, the Allied forces going against the Germans and their uh, combatants on their side, storming the beaches, risking blood and life and everything dear to them. And because of their sacrifice and their effort, you and I are not under German occupation today. Is that right? And we have the freedom, we have the blessings, we have the joy of living in this land because of what they endured. To imagine what they were willing to risk because of a battle, a war, that they thought was worth whatever it took in order to win. And so they did. But there was another war going on at that same time. It was taking place here in the United States as our sons were off on the battlefield. When the news flashed, the greatest amphibious invasion in history on the beaches of Normandy, France, paratroopers leaping from their planes, landing craft speeding toward the coast, there was in our own nation, among the people that remained here, a prayer battle imploring God for victory over the dark forces of fascism. 
Without question, one historian writes, a failed invasion of France would constitute a calamity of incalculable proportions for the Western allies. So as the word of the assault trickled out, Americans began to pray. Stores closed. Prayer services were swiftly organized in small towns and big cities. Photographs show, taken June 6, just how widespread the resolve to pray was. The sign in the window of a novelty button shop, sorry, no covered buttons today. We're praying for the success of the invasion. In front of a church building, come in and pray for allied victory, hourly intercession. Another photo shows people bowing their heads in prayer and on their knees fervently praying. Would you believe that the mayor of New York City, Ferrello La LaGuardia, for whom the airport is named, took to the airwaves and he urged citizens, send forth your prayers to Almighty God to bring total victory in this great and valiant struggle. We shall prevail over the unholy forces of our enemy. And so they did. You remember Winston Churchill's words, we shall fight in France on the beaches, on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall never surrender. A war correspondent named Ernie Pyle noted that the Allies achieved victory, quote, with every advantage on the enemy's side and every disadvantage on ours. And yet the Allied casualties were remarkably low, only a fraction of what our commanders had been prepared to accept. And Pyle finished, it seems to me, a pure miracle that we ever took the beach at all. Would you consider the impact of our nation beseeching God the impact on the physical war that took place that day? And could there be such a connection that the spiritual battle, coming before the throne, going to heaven with our pleas, that that was what led to God's answer and the victory that was accomplished that day? Not only that, whatever history may say about Franklin D. Roosevelt, he called the nation to prayer. He said, Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. Lead them straight and true. Give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts, steadfastness in their faith. They will need thy blessings. Their road will be long and hard. They'll be sore tried by night and day without rest. Some will never return. Embrace these, Father, and receive them. And for us at home, help us to rededicate ourselves in renewed faith in Thee in this hour of great sacrifice. It was the leader of our nation, the USA, in 1944. Many people have urged, he said, that I call the nation into a single day of special prayer, but because the road is long and the desire is great, I ask that our people devote themselves in a continuance of prayer. As we rise to each new day, and again when each day is spent, let words of prayer be on our lips, invoking thy help to our efforts. And then he closes, thy will be done, almighty God. I didn't read it all. You can look it up online. I find it absolutely inspiring. And so illustrative and so uh, demonstrative of the battle in which we are involved. Because things look so physical, so tangible, so material, so temporal. But what's really going on is the relationship we have with God and uh, the issues we face in terms of temptation and weakness and defeating habits and sin. So let's go to John 21 and let's think about that occasion when it seemed that all hope was lost and Peter heard the rooster crow and sure enough, before a charcoal fire, he had said three times, I am not a disciple of Jesus. I do not know him. And the last time he called out curses upon himself. And there was even a man who had witnessed, who was a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off. I saw you there. No, you didn't. And now Peter, who had boasted, I will never disown you, even if all others do. I will die for you. I will never turn back. And Jesus told him that he would. But he also said, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. 
And once you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. And now hope is revived. Jesus is alive. And we're not told why. Simon and several other disciples, seven of them, returned to the Sea of Tiberias, verse 1, also known as the Sea of Galilee. Perhaps so that this event could occur. That night they caught nothing. The day was breaking. Jesus was about a football field away on the beach. Children, you don't have any fish, do you? Cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat. They found a catch. Couldn't hardly bring in the great number of fish. It's going to be 153, in fact. And so the disciple whom Jesus loved, we think John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. Peter put his outer garment on. He had stripped for work, threw himself into the sea. That's Peter. He determined to get back to Jesus. The others came in the little boat, and when they arrived, there was a fire already burning and fish cooking there. And the Greek word used for the charcoal fire only appears one other time in the New Testament. And that's the previous charcoal fire where Simon stood before that servant girl and was intimidated and afraid and cowardly and rejected his relationship to Jesus. So now it's as if Jesus is setting the table. He's putting the scene together. He's going to have the pieces there. And just as Simon Peter was questioned those three times, Jesus will do it again. You may have heard there's a change in the Greek words in John 1, 21, that refer to love, that first Jesus says, do you agapao, agape, do you love me with that unconditional, godly love? And Peter responded, I love you with philia, kind of a brotherly love, like Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. And that the third time Jesus finally said, do you even love me with that love? It's possible that that distinction in words is significant for us, but I will tell you there are times in the New Testament when agape and philia are used interchangeably. They're not always uh, such a chasm between them. In fact, the Father's love for the Son is spoken of as philia in the Gospel of John. What troubled Simon Peter, if you read the text, is not the change in words But in verse 17, he was grieved because he said to him the third time. It was the number of questions that called back to Simon's mind what had happened before, where he had failed so miserably and wept so bitterly. So if there's a distinction in the Greek words, that's fine. But Peter was grieved because of the number. It's as if once wasn't enough, and Jesus asked him a second time and a third. And each time, the Savior tells him, I still have a purpose for you. Tend my lambs, feed my sheep. And Jesus' encounter with Simon Peter shows us that there's hope after failure. That the Bible, the gospel, is not only a manual for spiritual warfare, it is a medical aid book for the wounded. And every one of us, brothers and sisters, is wounded by sin. We have scars, we have pain, we have repercussions, we have consequences that we wish we could take back and we can't. And sometimes we read the Bible, for example, the keys of the kingdom, as we're discussing on Sunday morning. We might think, boy, that standard is so high. I've not reached that. I've not done that. Not a person among us has. We hold that banner where God put it, and we aim to reach toward it. And yet when we trip, and yet when we go back to that old way of thinking, that anger or that desire or that envy, or that impatience, or that outspoken word that doesn't honor God. We do something like that. Is it over? It's not over. Look at the difference between Simon Peter and Judas Iscariot, who apparently believed what he had done was too wicked to be forgiven. It was beyond grace. And so when he couldn't undo his betrayal and return the money in exchange for that, he went out and hanged himself. 
Judas could have come back. He wasn't willing because he didn't realize that there is recovery in the war within. And so Simon Peter goes on to become that outstanding spokesman for the Lord. And the inspired word tells us of all his flaws, all his wrongs, all his failings. And aren't you glad it does? Because that's what helps us identify when Simon Peter was sinking, trying to walk on water, Lord, save me. He stepped out. He made the effort. But he couldn't follow through. Or when he wanted to build the three shrines to honor Moses, Elijah, and Jesus at the Transfiguration, he spoke so rashly and impulsively. And the voice of the Father corrected him, This is my son. And you can see time and time again when Peter is so quick to act and so slow to think it through. And he and Jesus' other followers in that motley crew give us inspiration. They give us encouragement about the war within. Well, let's talk about some steps to recovery. As we do, I'll mention as many of you are familiar with Alcoholics Anonymous, yes? And the 12 steps that they have. And not too long ago, I found a book that takes those 12 steps, which are not entirely biblical, but adapts them to use in the process of helping others decide to follow Jesus. But as they might be used initially in evangelism, they're also effective in helping a person make his or her way back. First, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol that our lives had become unmanageable. Isn't that a tremendous first step toward recovery in the war within? Powerless, cannot do it without God's help, cannot and have not managed our lives. Second, we came to believe that a power greater than ours, we'd say that's the Lord God, could restore us to sanity. So first, an admission of what's happened and now a determination, a conviction that God can help us. We can be sane again. Third, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God. And they had the phrase, as we understood him. We would look at that biblically as the Bible describes him. But a conscious turn, our will and our lives to the care of God. Number four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Looked in the mirror. Honesty. Strip away the pretense and the hypocrisy and the show for what we really are, moral inventory. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Admitted it to God, to ourselves, and at least one other person. That brings accountability. That causes there to be another person that can follow up with us. Six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all the defects of character. That's repentance. We don't want them anymore. We're broken. We're messed up. Number seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all the persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Number nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Number 10, continued to take personal inventory when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Number 11, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of His will and the power to carry it out. Number 12, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we determined to carry this message to other alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. And the reason steps like that resonate with us as Christians is because all truth is God's truth. And factors like humility and confession and repentance and awareness and accountability, these are biblical teachings. So let's think then, from a biblical standpoint, first of all, we cannot recover if we are in denial or if we minimize what we have done, or if we blame someone else. 
oh, I was born this way, or I inherited this, or it's not that bad, or I could quit whenever I wanted to, or there are other people that are in worse shape than I am. As long as we do that, I'll never really be tempted with this again. We'll continue to fight that same issue over and over and over again. And so this idea that I'm powerless without the Spirit of God, without the Word of God, without the guidance of God. Someone says, oh, I just need to cut back. Like a person who's ill, pretending, oh, it's just a bug, it doesn't matter, it's not going to hurt anything, and then ignoring that condition until it becomes life-threatening. Oh, it's just my pressure at work. I'm just tired. It's the actions of others. As long as we use excuses like that, we will stay in the rut. We will stay down and not allow God to pick us up and put us on our feet. What are the things that triggered my sin? What happened before and then before and before? Can I see some dominoes? Can I trace back to a, an initial thing that I thought? When did the idea first come into my mind that I would say that or do that or break a promise or disobey God? And what happened before I had that thought? And then what choice did I make? And recognize that the trigger will come again. I'm going to deal with that scenario. I'm going to meet that person. I'm going to have that pressure at work. I'm going to have the opportunity to engage in some activity I shouldn't or look at something I ought not to. So I'm ready for the trigger because I've identified it and I've named it and I know how I reacted to it before. Leave the past behind. You remember Philippians chapter 3, forgetting what lies behind and what? Pressing on like a runner. I'm going to give it all I have to cross that finish line. I like the phrase that the past can refine me, but it doesn't have to define me. I can learn from it. I can be better having come through it. Not that I wish I had ever done it, but I won't let the past control me. Sometimes Christians reach a point, perhaps like Judas Iscariot did, where a person thinks, what I've done is so awful, it's so permanent, I can't retract it, I can't fix it, I can't unscramble the eggs, I can't undo the kite string. And because of that, I may as well just give up on my faith. And then that failure becomes their defining moment because they chose it to be the defining moment. Why not let the defining moment be the cross where Jesus died, the tomb where he was buried, and which is today open because he is alive again? Why not let the defining moment be your baptism into Christ? When you started fresh and you knew or should have known you weren't going to be perfect, that you would still face whether it was anger or wrong desires or difficulty with your speech, and, and so you started there and look at the progress you've made. The Lordship of Christ. That area which I will not surrender is the area in which I will never, never, never have victory. Until in my role as a husband or wife, I have surrendered myself as fully as I can to the power of God, I'll never be the spouse that God would want me to be. And I'll limit my home and my happiness and the effectiveness it's going to rub off on my children and my grandchildren. If my life at work or the use of my time or the money that God allows me to handle, if that's not surrendered to God, God wants to give me victory in that area, but I will not allow him to because I insist on keeping it for myself. We sing the song as we did this morning, I Surrender All. There's not one of us that 100% is surrendered to the will of God. And that's why I said more fully, beyond where I've been and what I've let go of. Here, God, you take this and you take this and you take this. As long as I manage it, God can't fix it. 
It's only what I put in his hands that he can heal. And then I got to thinking about repent, reverse, retreat, release, and then repeat. Repentance is a change of mind, determining to think about things the way God does. If God hates it, if it's an abomination, I must hate it. Not play with it, not consider it, not talk about it, not focus on it. And if it's something God loves, then I'm to love it with all of my heart. And it's to become my passion and my driving force. Repentance is not a change of this activity or that. It's not, well, I used to say that word and that. That all comes from the redirection of the mind. Reversing. Turning myself in the opposite direction. Retreating, pulling back for a while to take inventory of my life. And then releasing those emotions and the pain and the other effects of my sin. And then I can repeat that as many times as I need. Often Christians don't easily accept the fact that God has forgiven us. Because we study and we preach and we talk about what God expects us to do. And so when we hear about the power of the blood to take away our guilt, we want to think, perhaps, that we're not worthy. We're not where we ought to be. And sometimes people fall into the trap of a merit-based system, even though they try not to. And so you go back to where Jesus told that woman in Luke 7, 36 to 50, go in peace, your faith has saved you. Or the woman in adultery, John 8, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. Or that thief, today you'll be with me in paradise. And that means forgiving yourself too. Because if you insist that you are not forgiven and God says you are forgiven, do you really believe that God is telling the truth? If God says Jesus paid for that, died to provide redemption for that, and you insist on keeping it and carrying it and letting it weigh you down, I believe your focus needs to be, or mine does, on faith, on trusting what God has said about my sin. This idea of confession to God and to the person that I have wronged. And recognizing God's teaching about finding that individual, seeking to make things right to the degree that I can. There are sins that we commit that we can't fix, we can't repair, we can't turn the clock back. But we can say to that person, I was wrong, I sinned against you, I took something from you I can't give back. And I'm telling you today, if I had it to do over again, I would not do it. And I will do whatever is physically possible to make things right with you. The Bible is very clear about this, trying to set the record straight with one another and to confess directly to that individual. God's discipline it's an interesting theme in Scripture. You say, well, I'm forgiven. That should be the end of it. No. Where disobedience has occurred, as it did with King David, though Nathan the prophet said, your, sins are, your sin is forgiven, the sword will never depart from your house. And from that point forward, David had to face the repercussions. God's discipline. God corrected him. God chastised him. God brought into his life affliction that resulted from the decisions he made. Some suggest, I believe it's worth considering, that the sooner we repent, the easier will be the discipline. 
and the more we will be able to appreciate it and learn from it and move on as a result. Forgiveness and discipline are two different things, as they are with people. One person may wrong another, and that second person forgives, but there are still effects of that wrong that was done, and they continue. There are lessons to learn from the sin that you and I have committed. We already talked about the triggers and the dominoes and the, the things that took place leading up to the wrong we committed. But now to go back and kind of mine the whole wreckage, look for clues, see what we might learn about humility, about prayer, about study of the word, favorite scriptures that we make our own, that we wish we had mastered before we came into that situation. God is teaching you and me something from everything that happens in our lives. If we learn the lesson, we can draw closer to Him as a result. Accountability, friends, godly counsel, even professional help. Someone that can look at your life objectively and fairly. I would start with our shepherds, our elders, or our overseers. Or it might be a family counselor like Dan Florinoy, who is available to talk with any of our members at, at no cost, by the way. It's a ministry provided by the church, especially for family counsel. But someone that can see things from a godly perspective, not tainted, not subjective, not affected by the things that have happened in your life. Did you notice how after Jesus reinstated Simon, he used him to tell a crowd at Pentecost, this same Lord and Christ whom you crucified, you can repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and he'll take it away. Peter spoke as a wounded man to wounded people. He spoke as I do, as every preacher or teacher does, as a sinner to other sinners, as a dying person to dying people, as one who's stumbled and fallen to others who have stumbled and fallen. In Psalm 51, another beautiful passage about the recovery. That's where David, apparently after being with Bathsheba, said, renew a right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Purge me with hyssop, a plant like a sponge that could be used to rub and scrub a stain away. Then he says, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. You see, God wants to give you victory, not only for your own sake, but so that you might be more effective in your relationship with Him. And God, like a master sculptor, like an expert surgeon, wants to cut away that in your life and mind that does not reflect His image. Yes, to give us the joy and the peace and the sense of a right relationship with God, but also so that He can send us out to evangelize, to tell others there's good news in this war. And then as fellow soldiers in the church, someone mentioned in prayer this morning to bear one another's burdens, to carry each other on the battlefield, and to remind each other when we've fallen, that God has the power to restore. And then in the Christian life, there's always confidence, but there's always caution. The confidence is, I'm a child of God. I'm going to heaven. He is helping me to overcome sin. I'm recovering. I'm getting better. I'm closer to Him. I'm more like Him than I ever was before. But that can't become cockiness 
or self-assurance or something that focuses on you or me. And so there is with that the caution, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 and following. God wants me to move forward. Well, if I move forward and I sin again, I go back to recover again. And God, as I walk in the light, 1 John chapter 1, and confess my sins, the blood of Jesus cleanses me from all unrighteousness. When will the battle be over? When is the, for, uh, the, the war finally done? It's in heaven. And that's what we were singing about earlier tonight, walking alone at Eve. Recovery is ahead. In this life, it's bit by bit, piece by piece, victory over victory. But then when we see Jesus Christ, all the fighting will be over. No more conflict, no more tension, no more temptation. All gone. And won't that be the greatest joy of all? So I ask you and me tonight, not have you found complete recovery. Not have you overcome all the sin in your life so that you're no longer tempted. You never ever stop. I'm not going to ask you that. I'm going to ask you, are you in the war? Are you engaging the enemy? Are you responding to your failings as we've seen tonight? Is there some way we could assist you? We talked a few moments ago about repentance and baptism into Christ. If we could assist you in that way or if you have some prayer need or some way we could lift you up before the throne of God. We offer his invitation. Do we stand and sing?